I want you to take your Bibles. Our discussion today is going to be in the subject, we're going to look at some areas of Scripture. We'll be looking at some things in the book of um, Galatians. We'll look at several things there in Galatians, so keep that handy. We're going to look at some things in Luke chapter 14. We're going to look at some things in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, Joshua the last chapter. We'll look at some things there. Those are basically the things where we're going to go as we talk about the list. And I'm going to be asking you, what list are we talking about, all right? So I want you to be thinking about everything we're talking about is in the context of a list. Now, what list is it that we're going to be talking about? Anybody a basketball fan here? Any basketball fans? All right, a few of you. Good. Basketball. I was in academy high school. Uh, the academy that I was at didn't do any actual um, team sporting things. We didn't have the competition with other schools or any of that. Those weren't, that was kind of taboo when I was in school. It was just a little bit of intramural stuff, just playing among ourselves, that kind of thing. But there was always one game that was important. Our school had Alumni weekend was in the spring every year, and the culmination of alumni weekend was always the Saturday night basketball, the, the men's basketball game, uh, the, the, the alumni versus the, uh, the students. The bad news was it was my senior year, and my senior year, the, the three years that had been before that, we had always gotten skunked by the alumni. And, you know, we really didn't want to be the class that had had that happen all four years. And so we were thinking about that. And even at the end of, now again, early uh, or mid-April is always alumni weekend in the academy where I was at. And so about the time Christmas holiday was coming up, the first semester was coming to an end, several of us guys kind of pulled the PE teacher aside. And, you know, we called him coach and we said, now coach, how about if we do a little practicing this next semester? How about if you get us together and let us practice some? Now there was an ulterior motive going on here because what we really wanted was we were what we were really thinking is how about let us have some trial runs against some other teams in other places? You know, let us do some of that. We want to be able to do some practicing so we're ready to go after those alumni. He said, "Well, we'll think about it." first chapel program organized of the second semester just past Christmas. We all get back together in school and here comes the coach up in front of the total student body and he says, you know, we haven't done very well in alumni weekend. How would you like to beat those alumni this year? And everybody was, yeah, that's great. The whole school. Yeah, let's do that. All 300 strong, strong, strong students shout at once. Yeah, we're going to do it. How would you like to do that? Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to give you a chance to do that. We're going to give you a chance. We're going to be working on it all semester. And us guys are kind of looking at each other. Hey, it worked. We got him. This, we're going to get this. He says, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to let, we're going to have, uh, anybody can come to the practice. Something was sounding suspicious here. Any of you can come, and I won't be cutting anybody from the team. Now we're really getting suspicious. Something is wrong. And he says, now since we're a school and everybody is busy, the, um, the only time we can practice is 6 o'clock in the morning, and we'll do it three days a week. Now you don't have to understand, this was a day school. We were all spoiled homeboys. We didn't do 6 o'clock in the morning. The first class started at 8. None of us ever heard of 6 o'clock in the morning. Now he said, now here's what we're going to do. Nobody's going to get cut, but you will be at every practice on time or don't bother coming back. Okay. Monday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. Here come all of us guys drooling in, drool running out of our mouth, hair going in all directions, pillow lines on faces, staggering in there at 6 o'clock in the morning. He says, all right, everybody stand on the baseline. Okay. We'll do a little warm-up first. Let's do, oh, I don't know, 20 laps around the gym to get started, just to get you warmed up and loosening up. Well, everybody kind of staggered around and did that. Back on the line, on the baseline. Now what we're going to do is, now it's time. Did you know that most basketball games are won and lost by whether you're in shape? So we're going to work on getting in shape. This is not sounding good. 
So here's what we're going to do. Start on this line and run over to the free throw line and touch the line. Run back, touch the line. Run over here to the half court line, touch the line. Go back over here, touch the line. Run all the way over to the, to the basketball court to the other free throw line. Touch the line. Go back over here, touch the line. Go back over all the way to the other end, touch the line. Go back over here and touch the line. Do it twice. Roll. Uh-huh. All of us spoiled homebodies kind of staggered along, and then he says, okay, that was nice, but you didn't do very well. Do it again. Only this time, the last two guys to finish can do it again. Now, all of a sudden, we're in competition with each other, and everybody's staggering along. Now, you don't want to be the you don't, don't try to be the first, but you got to be the third from the last, you know? So, it, man, this was getting bad. About this time, we get staggering done to the end, and one of my buddies, he was the student association president. He goes to the, he, he decides to step out of the line, and he says, goes to, he was going to go negotiate with the coach, you know. Uh, coach, excuse me, but, Greg, are you quitting? Quitting? No, I'm here. Back in the line, or you can leave. Whoa, so much for the negotiations. Then he said, all right, the basketballs are rolling out, and we finally, we can get to bang blast playing basketball. This is a basketball practice. Well, that was the end of that. Did you know that most games come down to whether you can shoot free throws or not? So we'll make it interesting. All of you get together, and everybody shoot two free throws. For everybody, for every miss of the basket, for every miss, the whole group of you can stand under the different baskets all over the place and jump up and touch the basket ten times. For every miss. Everybody will do this. Got to be kidding. Except if you are over six feet tall, touching the base of the basketball uh, of the goal shouldn't be any competition for you, so you get to go the other six inches up and touch the rim. I'm six feet one and a quarter inches tall. I was never so mad about that one and a quarter inch before in my life. We're all getting here, so there's everybody jumping and hopping all over the place because you got these fools there that aren't going to make the team. Everybody knows it. They can't even hit the basket, and we've all got to jump 20 times for every one of them. People were getting upset. And again, somebody went, uh, it was me this time, uh, Coach, excuse me, I need to talk to you a little bit. X, are you in the line or are you quitting? No, I'm not quitting. Then I get back in the line or leave. I'm just here to talk. Uh, second warning, do you want to throw? Well, no, back in the line. We didn't even pull out the basketballs to actually practice for the first month. Three days a week of doing this. Do you want to play or not? Hmm. Huh. Take your Bibles. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Verse 25. Great multitude went with him. He turned and he said to them, If anyone comes after me, and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. By the way, folks, what's a disciple? What's a disciple? That's a, somebody that's following somebody else, right? Now, somebody that is a follower or a disciple of Jesus, the name came along a little later that we're kind of used to today. What's the word for somebody that is a follower of Jesus who is the Christ? What do we call him? So if you want to be a Christian, whoa. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. What is cross-bearing? Now, here again. In my few years on this earth, I've heard a lot of people bemoaning the crosses that they have to bear. Oh, my life is so hard. I've got to bear this cross 
My favorite is you get around the academy or the college where there's, you know, where there's room. My roommate, oh, I have such a burden to bear. My roommate is messy and dirty. And my roommate even has B.O. Oh, what a, I have such a cross to bear. When Jesus was talking about cross-bearing, what did it mean in Rome in the time of Jesus when somebody was, when saw somebody walking across, walking down the boulevard with the cross, carrying a cross with a couple Roman soldiers with him? What did it mean? Were they coming back? No. No coming back. It wasn't this esoteric stuff of, oh, poor is me. No, it was a, it was a death sentence. If you're going carrying your cross with a couple Roman soldiers, you weren't coming back. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Now we talk about cost counting. We talk about it quite a bit. You've got to call it the cost. In this case, what somebody's going to build a tower, they want to make sure they get the thing finished. Otherwise, they'll look like a fool. Count the cost. Get the budget right. And we talk about that. Oh, to be a Christian, you count the cost, which is true, but it isn't quite what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying, you decide what the cost is and what you want, whether you want to pay it or not. Jesus is saying, this is what it will cost. This is what it will cost, which leads us to list. What is the list that we're talking about today? The list. Jesus says, this is what it will cost. Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. It's pretty simple. If you want to be on the basketball team, be there at the practices. Do you want to be on this team? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you want it bad enough to be at the practices? Well, now that's a different story. Okay, then leave. Do you want to be on the basketball team? Then practice. Practice. If you want to be on the basketball team, skip the stop at the Dairy Queen on when you're done with practice. These are things that go into if you want to be on the team. Jesus says, now this is what I've done for you. Do you want to follow? This is what it will cost. Do you want to follow or not? Don't negotiate. Do you want to or not? Joshua. Joshua 24. Joshua 24. Verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord... Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which of your fathers served that were other sides of the river, the gods of the Amorites and those whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... I will serve the Lord. Notice, if you will, what the Lord is saying is pretty simple. I'm not interested in being your mistress that you use when you want to and wander away when you don't want to. Choose me or don't choose me. I am offering to you everything. I am offering you eternal life. I am offering you freedom. I am offering you hope. I am the one that I am the God who made you. I am the God who has created you. I am the God who is recreating you. Choose whether you want it or not, but don't choose to negotiate. It's not me and the gods of the Amorites and the idols and all these others. It's choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. By the way, this isn't even particularly worried about being particularly a, uh, um, a Christian concept. Do you know that? It's bigger than even what we're used to at a Christ, as a Christian so concept. Anybody have any debts? Anybody struggling with, with uh, more, more bills than paycheck? 
This is one of the top books out there. It's about 10 years old now. Uh, Gene Chatsky, one of the top people in the real financial planning industry. Her book is very simple, Pay It Down. Did you know that 10 bucks a day and you can have your bills paid off in a very short amount of time with just 10 bucks a day? That's the pay it down. Her whole principle is 10 bucks a day. Pull out a $10 bill, and if you'll bid 10 bucks a day onto it, you can knock down your bill. If you've got, if you've got $25,000 of unsecured debt out there that you want to get rid of, if you'll go to 25 bucks a day, just 25 bucks a day, you can have that thing paid off in, in three years, even with massive interest on it and everything. You can. Do you know that? But there's the kicker. Where do you get 10 bucks a day? It's got to come out of your budget so that you can put it toward the debt. Oh, now this is where this gets interesting. What does that mean? And Jane Chatsky is pretty simple. She says, if you want it, it's a question of how brutal do you want it? How brutal do you want it? Where do you come up with 10 bucks a day or 25 bucks a day? Before you say 10 bucks a day, that's nothing. Yeah, that's true. But that's 300 bucks a month. If you want to go 25 bucks a day, that's 750 bucks a month out of your budget to put down toward bills. By the way, you keep doing that after the bills are done, you can be a millionaire in just a few short years. But the kicker is, do you want to find how brutal do you want to be? Here's another one. Uh, the money coach, how to get to your first million. In about 20 years, you can be a millionaire with the same principle. If you don't have debts and you just put it the other way, about 20 years, you can be a millionaire. If you'll take that same principle, just this many bucks a day. But to get to those bucks a day, you've got to sacrifice the other thing. By the way, did you know, funny thing about money, pull out a dollar bill, how many times can you spend it? There's the problem. If we're going to put it toward this, that means we can't use it toward that. And that means if we've got to find 10 bucks a day to put into paying down that bill, that means taking that 10 bucks a day out of our budget. That might mean not stopping off for the latte tomorrow. That might mean going, instead of going to the gym to do your workout, it might mean doing some things and doing push-ups in your backyard. It might mean doing something different. If you're saying, I don't have 10 bucks a day in my budget, not a problem. Get a second job. That's what Gene Chatsky says. Oh, can't do that either. Not a problem. What are you going to sell? See, it's that brutal. Jesus says, if anyone comes after me, must deny himself. Follow me. I will not be, Jesus respects himself enough that he will not be your mistress that you play with when you want to and go do something else when you want to. What is this list that we're talking about? Galatians. Oh, by the way, the sports illustration. Did you know the sports illustration shows up in the Bible too? It does, the same sports illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you will obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Know that to obtain it, uh, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Therefore I run, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. There's your sports illustration. How bad do you want it? Same illustration, same issue. Galatians. Look at Galatians. To the churches in Galatia, Paul, an apostle, verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away to, uh, so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Well, what's a different gospel? He says any different gospel isn't really a different gospel at all. It's a false gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who is, was 
is God, became part of the human family, died on a cross, lived a life, died on a cross, became part, um, was resurrected, is going to come back and take his people home. The gospel is Jesus. The gospel is not Jesus and me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is not me living anymore. It is Christ that is living in me. Does that make sense? The gospel is not what am I doing. The gospel is Jesus Christ. As soon as I mix the gospel of Jesus Christ and put me in the gospel, as soon as the gospel becomes Jesus and me, I have just made it a false gospel. I'm doing the same thing as the people in, in Joshua's day that are saying, oh yeah, we want to worship the Lord. We'll worship the Lord, but we want to worship the Lord and these idols over here of the, upper, of the other ones. We want to worship both ways. We want to catch it both ways and make sure that's okay. Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the gospel. Paul says, no, 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 that's not the gospel. The gospel is not Christ and me. The gospel is Christ in me. Keep reading. Chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed that among you is crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Which is it? Any attempt to try and make it both is a false gospel. Any attempt to do that is adding a second gospel. Jesus says, I'm not interested in your second gospel. Keep reading. It gets uncomfortable. Chapter 4. Paul comes to an illustration in verse 21 and onward. He says, do you remember the story of Abraham? Do you remember the story of Abraham? Well, what's this story? Remember Abraham? The guy that God said is going to be the one the lead, the, that's going to have many children, is going to have his, be his blessed. Remember that? Remember that? And Abraham was praying for years for this child, Abraham and Sarah. Chapter 16, Sarah comes up with this bright idea. This bright idea. Well, why don't we use the handmaiden here? Now, in that culture, in that day, it was okay to have multi-wives. So Abraham really didn't do anything technically wrong. And here we have now Hagar and Ishmael. Chapter 21, Isaac comes along. And oh, everybody's so happy Isaac has come along. By the way, have you heard the story? You heard, seen the bulletin blooper? Have you seen the bulletin blooper? No, bullet, bulletin misprint? Oh, we are so overjoyed. We're going to have a baby shower. Come and celebrate together, and here it comes. Here comes the blooper. Come and celebrate together the sin of Pastor and Mrs. Jones. <laughs> Isaac comes along, Genesis chapter 21. And Hagar and Ishmael are over on the sidelines laughing. And Sarah says, this won't do. And she says, Abraham, cast that bondwoman and her child out. Now notice, if you will, the Bible says, you read through the story, in the next verse, Abraham, the Bible says, and it displeased Abraham. I'll bet it did. That bondwoman was his wife. That bondwoman's child was his child. They've got to go. Galatians uses that as an illustration. Cast out the bondwoman and her child. Get rid of them. And Abraham wasn't talking about that bondwoman and her child. He was talking about his child. You ever get uncomfortable with sometimes with what the Bible says? And by the way, Abraham didn't think this was such a great idea, and God gave him a vision, and God said, I agree with Sarah, they got to go. I was walking through the church lobby a bunch of years ago now, walking through the church lobby, minding my own business, when I saw the associate pastor had a fellow there, and the fellow was noticeably upset. He was one of our members, we knew him well, but he was very upset. 
And as uh, their, their conversation was kind of wandering, winding down as I was wandering by. And it, I could tell the guy was not satisfied or happy. And the pastor kind of said, well, you know, I'll keep praying for you. You hang in there and keep praying. You just, you just keep praying. It'll be all right. And, and they separated. And he was still standing there. And he was angry and he was very agitated. And I said, what's wrong? First words out of his mouth. She left me. Who? Well, my wife. She left me. I said, really? Yeah, left me high and dry. Well, I knew him and I knew her and something wasn't adding up. You know, it's just, it's got to be more to this story. What do you mean she left me? What do you mean? She left me. And I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. I said, really? What do you want? He said, well, I want her back. I said, then do you think giving her a piece of your mind is going to help? Well, that slowed him down a little bit. But she left me. I said, well, what happened? What's going on? And then the story came tumbling out. He and his wife were high school sweethearts. They were very, very young, and they got some things a little out of order, if you get what I mean. And in getting some things out of order, when the word came out within the families, both families decided we have to do something. These were kids that were going to have a child, and what are we going to do, and how shall we do this? And it seems that both parents, both sets of parents got together, and anyway, an adoption was worked out. So the child was put up for adoption. It was, an in fam it was a family type thing, so the fa they knew the family that took the child. So the, the family, the baby is adopted out. These two young people finish their, continue on, finish their high school, get on with their life. They get married. They have children of their own. But somewhere in there as time was going along and as baby was, uh, was not a baby anymore and was very much growing up, we're getting into the Internet age. And in getting into the Internet age, this guy had gotten on the Internet and was making contact and he was talking with this regularly with this girl that he had adopted out. Nobody from either of the families knew about this conversation that was going on regularly. When his wife found out about it, she almost had a nervous breakdown from all the things that were happening. And she literally walked out and went to her parents to try to think. And this guy is ticked off that she left me. And I said, You did what? He says, well, yeah, I've been interacting with her regularly. I said, I've got a question for you. He says, yeah. My question is, who is your priority? He said, they all are. I said, I got some bad news for you. Your priority list is not determined by what you put on the list. That's not a priority list, that's a wish list. It's only a priority list when you scratch something off of the list. It's a wish list when you have everything thrown onto it. It's not a priority list until you've taken some things off. Who is your priority? What do you think I need to do, he said. I said, it's very simple. Break it off with that girl and tell your wife you love her and you're sorry. Well, I can't do that. I said, you're about to ruin two families. He says, well, I can't give her up. I said, you can't give her up. That train left the station 15 years ago. You made that choice when you signed the adoption papers. That is not your daughter. Get back to taking care of your family. Cut it off. We had some tears. Abraham is told, cast out the bondwoman. And I will ask you, what is on your priority list? And I don't mean your wish list. 
What is on the priority list? What have you scratched off of the wish list? Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's the verse in Luke? Verse 33. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will take care of themselves. But is Jesus Christ the first and only priority? Jesus is not saying this to be selfish. He is saying, I know what it'll take to be ready for the second coming of Jesus. I know what it'll take. I know what, it, what kind of shape you need to be in. I know what kind of circumstances to be waiting and ready for the second coming of Jesus. And the issue is not, I demand to take everything, but the issue is, is Jesus Christ first and primary and only thing on that priority list? If there's other stuff on that list, it is not a priority list. It is a wish list. And you haven't gotten serious yet. Talk about that in the context of spiritual gifts. Am I giving it all to Jesus? Is He number one? When I accept the Jesus is my Savior. Do I accept that Jesus is my Lord? The two go together. Is Jesus the Lord of my life? Is He the priority of my life? Because this is what it'll take for victory. Because as Galatians says, I have been crucified with Christ. Have I? Have I been crucified with Christ? Then it is not I. It is Christ living in me. And that doesn't mean negative anything, but it does mean, has it been put on the altar? Because Jesus is my priority. He give, wants to give us everything, but He will not be our mistress. He respects Himself too much for that. Is Jesus the priority list? If not, you don't have a priority list yet. You've just got a wish list. And that's a way to lose everything. Heavenly Father, we see Jesus. Heavenly Father, if there's things in our lives that are interfering in our relationship with Jesus, I pray that you... Point that out to us. As Abraham, in fear and fright and frustration, followed you all the way by saying, okay, I will cast out the bondwoman. Father, if there are things in our lives that need to go so that you are the priority in our life, Help us to stand with Jesus Christ is the priority of my life. And we thank you, for we ask it in his name. Amen.